Thank you very much. Uh, can everybody uh, hear me? Yes. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for participating to this session. Uh, we hope that uh, through this session we will be able to exchange and share ideas about uh, what kind of uh, uh, actions and topics can uh, uh, companies and uh, institutions in Japan do to promote um, uh, competitiveness and, and exploration. Uh, the way we will conduct the, um, the, the panel is uh, each of us will uh, take a few minutes uh, to introduce some of um, uh, their thinking or their institution thinking um, on this topic. Uh, we'll start with myself as the title of the panel have clearly pointed out that I probably should start uh, um, on uh, some of the reports. Um, and then we'll p go to Mark Amesan, who has uh, recently been participating to a, in OECD report, I think is uh, very uh, uh, timely. Uh, Ankur Saku will then follow uh, with some perspective of his experience of working with both um, Japan and India uh, on uh, for uh, with um, very private equity uh, uh, topics. Uh, and then um, Ishiguro San will uh, talk a little bit about her own experience in, in helping companies in this uh, equation of uh, competitiveness. Um, and then uh, we'll continue for a, a bit and then open up for Q&A. Uh, so let me start with um, a few words about uh, the uh, um, report we recently published in March on uh, the future, what we call the future of Japan. Um, and that um, report basically came from the question uh, of, uh, you know, in the, in the light of an aging society which reduces the workforce um, and with the frame that you have a, there is a society framework in Japan that people would like to conserve, uh, can you um, uh, maintain this? and what would be needed for uh, actually uh, promoting the right uh, economic framework. And so, and the, f the key question is clearly around productivity growth. Uh, if you go back uh, and look uh, last 20 years in Japan, um, 20 years ago you could argue that uh, Japanese economy was a two-tier economy, where you had exporting industries, um, uh, manufactured manufacturing uh, would be uh, high productivity. Domestic industries were low productivity. And many people would have argued and had argued that this was fine. Um, this would you know, continue forever. Uh, the problem when we did the same analysis uh, last year, what we realized is that actually we've now lost productivity in every industry, uh, except automotive which you know, has to have some exceptions. Um, and so therefore, there is a much more profound. When you look at where the productivity growth comes from, which is on this chart, we've compared it uh, between the US and Germany. You could take a number of other advanced countries. What's a big difference is that, um, is that um, what, where Japan has not been successful is in value added per hour worked. So in a sense, we've done the classical productivity cost reduction of we have less people, therefore we get more productive. That, that Japan has done. But it has not been successful in value added. So the question then become to us is, assuming we have the right framework, are there opportunities for value added increase, which clearly comes from innovation? And so what we did is we looked at um, uh, basically what are the major trends that are changing the world, and does Japan have assets that follow those trends. Uh, you can take any types of uh, uh, work we do, McKinsey Global Institute, uh, we tend to look at um, uh, five major trends around uh, emerging markets development and global trend, uh, around aging, around disruptive technologies. We've identified 12 te technologies that are going to disrupt the whole world, around urbanization uh, and scarcity of resources. What's very interesting is when you look at it, you can map out many uh, technology that will change the world in the next 20 years, in which Japan has today already an edge. So it comes from uh, medical, where uh, med um, Japan has, for example, an advance in uh, regenerative medicine. It also has a lot to offer in terms of sensors, in terms of uh, remote sensing, uh, medical device. Some of the best medical device companies are in, in Japan. It comes from uh, areas around smart cities, uh, where Japan has already put a lot of effort into managing infrastructure and improving it. Um, it talks about uh, digital, not so much on the software side, but very much on the sensor 
uh, and the integrative uh, capabilities um, that you can have. It talks about robotics, etc. I can name probably 20 or 30 of areas where Japan has this uh, idea. So the question is, how do we get that right, and how is the balance of that versus the classical productivity measures? And so what we found out is we looked in depth at four sectors in Japan uh, to try to get a sense of the overall framework. Uh, we looked at advanced manufacturing, the hallmark of Japan's competitiveness in the past. We looked at um, uh, retail, because it's a very in-depth service sector. Uh, we looked at banking and insurance, because it's a massive force in Japan. And we also looked at healthcare. Why? Because every time I had that conversation about the future of Japan, my uh, friends from overseas would always come back and say, yes, but isn't Japan going to go bankrupt because of aging? And so we said, OK, mate, let's look at it and make sure that happens. What you find is what's interesting is the same themes happen. And there is overall about a 28% improvement in value added at stake. Doesn't mean that we will all make it, but it is there. Uh, where it comes from is about 2 thirds of it is what I would call making sure that every company in the value chain uh, adapts the best practices in a disciplined way. Japanese companies tend to be very good at manufacturing and development, have a very monozukuri uh, philosophy with Kaizen. The application of the same discipline in other functions, and we'll talk about marketing or supply or, supply or sourcing, is mixed is to be diplomatic. Uh, and so if you actually put all of this together, including using digital as a way to forward, you can actually improve by a significant amount. The second area, the second area is around next generation technology. That's what I talked about. Uh, 3D printing, uh, new, new medicine, et cetera. Uh, it's about uh, big data and advanced, uh, uh, advanced analytics. And then the rest is around making sure the framework in terms of where the company employs, in terms of structure and discipline, particularly around capital allocation and resource allocation, is actually uh, well done. Because one of the issues of the Japanese is we don't probably put the money into the right, into the more advanced areas. So that's, in a nutshell, what the um, uh, uh, issue is. Now, that will not just be a, a sufficient to be alone. You need to change the economic context. I think everybody knows about it. We've identified four areas we think are very important. One that many people know is about uh, making sure that we have the right, that we maximize the number of people who are successful in the workforce, come from immigration, women, uh, aging. Uh, one is around you know, market-oriented reforms, which is a lot of what is talked about in the third, uh, in third arrow. But we actually think that there is a couple of things that are very important and, and probably not sufficiently uh, discussed. One is education. And it's not education just in the university, but it's continuing education in the workforce. If what I said is true about technology change, that means that probably 60 to 70% of jobs will change, current jobs. And therefore, we need an education for people to adapt to the new reality. And the second very big area is around entrepreneurship. And I think we'll get more around this. But it's not just about being an entrepreneur. I think there is many people in Japan who can have that. But it's about creating the context by which entrepreneurs can be successful on a global scale to help uh, uh, Japan get its innovation. So this is roughly in a nutshell. So what, uh, uh, again, uh, we, we said is, there is a clearly assets that Japan can use. It is about getting in ahead of the wave of innovation and global trends. Uh, but it is a lot of it is in, um, in the hands of companies and institutions. And to some extent, we label that in the, in the report the sort of force arrow of companies doing uh, and acting as being the area. So that's uh, in a nutshell what I wanted to share with you as a backdrop to this, uh, uh, to this uh, context. And, uh, uh, maybe um, I'll turn to uh, Murakami-san to talk a little bit about her view based on recent reports that OECD has done. Okay, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, this is actually very timely because at um, uh, OECD we just published a report on this very important topic. Uh, um, and this report is, is not specifically about Japan, but it's real looking at the global trends uh, when it comes to productivity. So uh, let me just highlight a few um, findings from this re report. And there are probably quite a few lessons or you know, the elements that 
applies to the Japanese um, uh, situation when it comes to productivity and innovation. One of the interesting things that uh, we have um, um, identified in this study is that productivity on a global basis is slowing down. You can see from this chart, the green, um, the bar, uh, bars are from uh, 1990 to 2000, and red, 2000, 2007, and blue is the most recent period, 2007 to 2013. As you can see very clearly here, not, not only in Japan, but in pretty much all countries, in OECD countries, productivity has come uh, slowed down quite a bit. So this may be a little bit surprising to, to, uh, to some of you, but this is something that we have confirmed um, uh, with a, a number of uh, data points that we have collected. So that's number one finding that we all have to remember. This is not Japan only problem, but this is a problem that we're seeing in almost all developed economies. Um, if you can take a look at this one, this is actually um, probably one of the major reasons as to why this is happening, the slowdown of uh, productivity. It's not so much um, innovation, um, a lack of innovation. It's not so much because companies are not innovating. It's not because there's a lack of innovation. Innovation is there. The problem is r really diffusion. It's not spreading out. So there are a bunch of companies who have great ideas, innovative ideas, different business models, and different technologies, products. But the problem is innovation is not spreading out. It's not really working in terms of um, uh, diffusion mechanism. So if you can look at the, uh, the manufacturing sector, uh, sorry, the, again, yeah, uh, the, the, the frontier firms, uh, those are the companies who are uh, most innovative. Um, if you look at it, it's 3.5%, and that's a pretty decent growth rate. That is basically more than double of the average one point, uh, is that 1.4? Um, so you can see the gap between the most innovative companies and, and the rest, it's, it's expanding. But even more so in the service sectors, if you look at the, uh, the second chart, the gap is humongous. So most innovative companies in service sectors, I mean, there are a bunch of different service sectors, but in general, 5.5%, 5.0%, which is a pretty decent number. But again, if you look at the overall average, 0.3. So the gap is expanding and gap is pretty big. This is exactly why on an aggregate basis we are seeing innovation and productivity slowing down in the recent years on a global basis. So in this report we identify several factors as to why this diffusion mechanism uh, may not uh, be working. Um, and some of the factors that I'm going to explain um, in my comments may apply to the Japanese situation, so we can talk about that later on in the discussion. Uh, one of the most important things that, that we need to see, um, if you really want to see this diffusion mechanism to work, is the ability for companies to learn from the most advanced companies globally not only from the domestic market in the case of Japan, but the companies to be able to learn from globally most advanced companies, whether it's about technologies or products or business models, that ability is crucial. The second uh, important factor is the um, uh, ability for companies to enter the market. They need to be able to enter uh, the marketplace and experiment their products, their technologies. So it's really important for, um, for policymakers to make sure that new players are uh, welcomed uh, in the competitive marketplace. The third factor, which I think is really critical here, is for those companies to grow, not everyone to grow, but for startups, it's great to have startups. It's important. We see a lot of start startups. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter unless they grow. So startup companies who deserve to grow, they need to be given opportunities to grow. That means they need to have access to capital. That means they have to have access to skills. Um, and I think this is actually one of the most important things that, that, that we need to really discuss here. Because I think Japan has a lot of startups. Do they grow? And unless they reach the optimal level in terms of uh, uh, skill, unless they have a certain skill merit, they really can't have much of an impact on the macro level. So that's the third point. Um, the last point, which I think is also probably very relevant in Japan, is the matchmaking. 
and the uh, matchmaking in terms of uh, technologies, matchmaking in terms of um, the uh, the skills, uh, technologies, and, and, and the personnel. And the innovation really goes beyond technologies. It's about management know-how, for example. It's about you know uh, know-how. You know how to how to build a team, how to run a team, how to run a company. Um, it may not be the technology that you may think, uh, but this is actually really innovation. So it's, innovation is just not only technology or products, uh, but it's about the people, it's about the skill sets. Um, and, and unless we actually have a good match, I think uh, you made earlier um, uh, this really interesting point about um, education. And actually, this is a very good one. This is. Um, Sorry, this chart shows the mismatch of skills. Japan has one of the longest schooling years in the world. Does Japan have a light? Uh, does Japan have the uh, um, the skills that the economy needs? The answer is probably no, um, to some degree. So you can see from this chart, in almost all countries, we see mismatch uh, between the, the kind of skills the economy needs and the supply, i.e. people who have been educated, uh, but who may not have the right skill sets. Uh, if you can just go back to one, um, yes, this is actually, a, um, uh, this is to show the uh, breakdown of companies in terms of old companies and new companies. Uh, small companies and large companies. You can see Japan is one of the, uh, where is Japan? Um, Japan is, 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 is the, the country that has the, the biggest share of old and biggest. So remember we talked about how it's important to have startup companies, but they need to grow. They need to grow, and that's the problem we have. Um, so I just stop my comments here, and then we can talk about uh, the implication of these studies later on. Ankur, I think you'll be... In and it would be interesting to get your sense of how you compare that, having been really straddling Japan and India. Sure, sure. Um, thanks. Thanks, George. Thanks, everyone. Um, I was asked to say the comments are off record, so let me get that out there. But uh, I've had the uh, uh, fortunate experience of having worked in Silicon Valley, then Japan, then India now, and, and uh, continuing to be based in Japan. And so a lot of observations are from investing in companies uh, in those geographies. And I would say, uh, you know, probably, probably it's highlighted best by sharing sort of three industries where Japan really had the edge and today it doesn't. And, and then I can sort of start to talk about what, what I believe are some of the reasons, but then we can talk about what, what needs to be done because it's not all lost um, as the theme of this conference is. So first, um, I was an engineer, believe it or not. Not a good engineer, that's why I moved to finance. <laughs> but uh, uh, I started off in uh, working for uh, Matsushita Denki in Osaka, designing uh, IC chips. And uh, in those days when I graduated, Japan had seven out of the top 10 semiconductor companies in the world. NEC was the number one. Um, and I think most of the times, you know, the whole infrastructure, whether it was from METI to the banks, everyone was very supportive. And uh, what happened then? Uh, there was there was a temporary shock in the market in in the memory market where um, the companies went in a loss for a short period of time. And in these types of technologically advanced industries, you have to continue investing to to stay ahead of the others. Um, and I think not to put the blame on anyone, or I'll get in a lot of trouble. But but fundamentally. Uh, the infrastructure stopped investing because they were not confident of the ability to continue the leadership. And so from seven, we went to five, to three, to I think barely now Toshiba and Renesas are in the top 10, but I'm not even sure if they are. And contrast that with no company in Korea, no company in Taiwan. Today they have you know two of the top three leading semiconductor uh, process technology uh, uh, companies in the world. The next is a great example of today's world. So semiconductor is boring, old world, but let's talk about today's world. We all use telecom, I mean, uh, cell phones. You know, Docomo was the first company to come out with the iMode system, and uh, it was you know, revolutionary. And in fact, all of the packet-based applications today are fundamentally based on that technology. But inherently, it was a closed system, and um, 
you know, so much so that even the device manufacturers were not allowed to standardize uh, and, and, and help spread that globally. So out of nowhere, a five, 10 person team writes a software program called Android and, and, and starts licensing to everyone. And we all know what happened there. The third is, um, you know, I was also involved. We were investors in Sanyo. Sanyo had the top three um, renewable energy uh, technologies in, in, in the world. And uh, so much so when, when I was on the board and we would talk about it, the Chinese names and the German names, people would laugh it off saying, oh, that's bad technology. They're never going to make it there. Today, uh, you know, China's by far, not just on the cost side, but even on a, on a conversion and technology and, and productivity side, leading companies in the world. So, you know, what happened? Because Japan clearly has innovation. And uh, fundamentally, I think from my own observations, I could crystal, crystallize it down to sort of four things. One is an element of risk. I think longer term risk versus the priority and the criteria that the management is given, which is you're here for five years, don't screw up, you know, hand over to the next person and then move on. So investing today for something that may come out 10 years later or 15 years later is just not, not sort of encouraged. Um, second is reliance on the domestic economy. And I think this is a subtle point, but the good news is Japan is the second largest economy in the world, third largest today. But Inherently, Japanese companies could make tons of profit just focusing on Japan. Nobody cared. Uh, and I think now people are becoming more cognizant because the next phase of reliance was on China, where China was welcoming Japan and trying to get technology and products and know-how. So that was sort of the other leg of growth for the last 20 years. Now I think both those legs are getting weak. and so. You know, a lot of the discussions around here are about what do we need to do. But really, the, the size of the economy was actually a negative because you could just rely on, on making profits and decent money. So you know, nobody wanted to be a Google or, or own the world. You were just happy being you know, uh, the big companies there. Um, the third is capital. I think we talked about it. Um, you know, Japanese ha Japan has a very strong commercial banking system. That was what enabled Japan after the war to grow. Uh, but then that same banking system is very sort of rightfully so. They're you know commercial banks. Their their goal is to c manage capital, but ultimately that element of capital that's available is very strict on taking risks, and that was one of the reasons why sort of those three industries also didn't didn't happen. And then on the flip side, startups again you know you know my senpai Horisan you know he's one of the visionaries to invest in in uh, s startups, but there's not enough people investing in startups. I mean, compared to venture capital in, in Silicon Valley or even China or even India, uh, the amount of venture capital in Japan is, is tiny. And it's just not about the capital. It's also, I remember when we were investing in companies in Silicon Valley, uh, you know, Cisco would buy products from a five-person company. I don't have to tell this esteemed room that you know, the day a big company buys a product from a small company is still far away because there's just not that element of risk taking. So that was capital was a third. And the, the last thing is people. And I know there's a lot talked about it. It's a sensitive topic. But, you know, I think the success of Silicon Valley and in India is all about people and encouraging people and, and uh, uh, getting smart people from all over the world to come here and, 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 and uh, be part of the society. And so. I'll just stop there, and there's some thoughts in the next round about you know, what, what we can try to do uh, to make this better. Thank you, Uncle. I think I'll turn now to Ishigo-san to talk a little bit about your observations and maybe bring us back to practical things you think can be done. Yeah, OK. Um, um, anyway, thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, maybe a technology or productivity things from the, uh, the IT uh, industry point of view. Uh, you know, my slide is pretty simple. You know, I was a member of uh, uh, cabinet office, uh, the member of the cabinet office, the so-called uh, uh, choice for the future, you know, last year. So that is, uh, you know, so the first meeting chairman told us, let's, let's discuss about 50 years from now. <laughs> you know, huh? Uh, <laughs> if, you know, so the, we see the future in 50 years is miserable, we have to cope with something. And we define 50 years from now, 
was very miserable. Um, just because of the well, decreasing pop, you know, population, demographic change. You know, 50 years from now, Japan, uh, the size of the market uh, population is two thirds of our current population. So how we can stay as we are, or how we can increase the value of the com uh, country. The solution is, uh, you know, how we can add value. You know, of course, uh, so one of the way to do is uh, keep the number of the workforce. But it's difficult. It takes time to change the population. But the formula is very simple. You know, adding value is number of the workforce times added value per capita. So we're going to argue how to increase the workforce. The easiest way is women come back to the market. So the next is immigration. So more increase the immigrant. The third is ask you guys to work more. <laughs> you should be healthy. But uh, in the second one is uh, how to add value per capita. So there is, I think, two ways as adding value. One is increasing the value. The other is decrease the time to input. It's a matter of output and input things. In terms of efficiency, we can put the less number in the bottom number. The other way is effectiveness. You know, the, with the same input, you know, create more value. If we can do it both, our future is bright. So I think that's almost of, of my argument. Um, I'm going to discuss how to do it. But uh, you know, so one is data, digital for marketing. Because you know, I've been in the United States for a long time. You know, so since I was a student on the MBA of Stanford, then after that I create, uh, I set up my own company to do uh, some uh, cross-border transaction, you know, helping a Japanese corporation to find a new technology in the United States or U.S. startup how to come to Japanese market. So, but. I found that you know, Japan is very, very behind in terms of marketing. Japan, is very, Japan has a very strong sales force, but that's it. You know, having a you know, good sales force does not really, well, OK, it's OK, you know, so having a good sales force. But marketing is very opposite way of sales. Marketing is a way of you know, making a best system to sell the product or service without the sales. You know, best price, you know, best product, best, you know, place, or something like that. So Japan has a good sales force, but not really good at make the system. Japanese is not, I would say, it's not really logical. So we have to change it. The other way is the, you know, so that's we, uh, you know, so today's topic, productivity. So I was in a member of, I was an employee of Brother Industries that is making a fax or, you know, printer, these things. You know, so the, I know the productivity of a factory was great. That's why I kind of misunderstood. Japanese company has a good productivity, but it's not true. You know, going back, you know, so you look at the, office, um, white color, productivity is so bad. So I mean, you are the criminal. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about later how, you know, how to change our system. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is uh, very provocative for the audience, but um, but I, I have to say that um, uh, that is also my observation is that there is a has been a, an incredible focus on productivity in terms of manufacturing productivity, and therefore there has been a very very limited view of that. And I think part of it is um, full employment, 
uh, that are trying to keep it. But I think that has some adverse effect that therefore you don't really try to optimize what happens. Um, uh, Yumeko, maybe from your experience, you've, you've lived a long time in, in the United States. Do you agree with that the issue is marketing or is it something more profound that needs to be happening? What's your sense of what could companies do? Um, there are a bunch of things companies can do. There are a bunch of things government can do as well. But just on the private sector side, um, you know, from small things to very large, you know, so strategic changes, um, a number of things. And I, I already see some companies actually making quite a bit of uh, a change in terms of the way they run their companies, which is very encouraging. Uh, one of the most important changes, uh, I believe, uh, that the companies uh, in Japan need to, to, uh, to make is the uh, personnel strategy. Um, I'm not arguing that um, a lifetime employment system should change. It, in some ways, actually, this gives Japan a competitive advantage. Um, uh, the war for talent uh, on a global scale is actually very, very uh, intense. So for Japanese um, uh, companies to retain talent, it's actually not a horrendous system. I think what needs to change is to make sure that the uh, merit-based compensation scheme, merit-based um, promotion scheme, Scheme, uh, is introduced. I don't think, again, I'm not arguing that uh, Japanese companies sh you know, should be run like American companies, European companies. I, I think they should be different. But perhaps what I think would be very effective is to come up with a hybrid uh, personnel uh, strategy where the Japanese companies retain these long-term long views in terms of how they recruit employees, how they train you know, employees, um, which I think is, a, again, very, very strong competitive advantage uh, you know, on the part of Japan. But what's lacking is internal competitiveness. Um, so we need to make sure Japanese companies have this element of merit-based compensation. Uh, Seniority-based compensation, to some degree, has to go away. And again, I'm not saying it should go away completely, because uh, I think there is a wisdom uh, that you can, you can, you can um, obtain only because you have spent certain amount of time. But at the same time, if you rely on your decision-making process in terms of who should be promoted, who should, be get, you know, who should get paid more, based on seniority, there is a lot of mismatch. We talked about mismatching of skills. We are uh, missing a lot of the, the new talents that you may have um, you know, in the younger generation. So I think w first thing I would suggest for Japanese companies is, is to come up with a hybrid um, personnel decision-making process or personnel really HR strategy, where they combine the Japan's strongest, probably, um, uh, you know, advantage uh, in terms of having longevity, having a very sustainable um, um, you know, views on, on, on personnel. At the same time, introduce the element of uh, uh, merit-based uh, compensation, merit-based promotion. I see you <laughs> wanted to no, no. get no. the audience. Well, well, uh, I completely agree with, uh, uh, agree with uh, uh, Kumiko. <laughs> Yumiko, <laughs> sorry. Close enough. OK. Um, but uh, I, yeah, I understand. But uh, you know, so at least I think you know, so Japanese company has to have a more performance-based compensation because, you know, un Uncle, Uncle argue that uh, you know the reason uh, you know so why startup grow is uh, big corporation you know hire the new technology from startup that's happening in Silicon Valley because you know so they have a performance compensation system. The reason why you know employee or decision make maker want to hire new technology to compete with uh, as a company. But in Japan, usually, you know, decision maker just to stay as a current technology because they are afraid of pu be punished if they mistake. So, well, human resource system and compensation system has to be more competitive. That's my argument. Ankur, you, you, you've dealt with small firms, medium firms in your buying them in, 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 in Japan, in, in India, in other parts of the world. Do you agree that that's performance based is, is the key or is there other things that I think you, you think would make a big difference in making success happen? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, think, I think that's a philosophy we use and it's not just theory. I think in all the companies we've invested in in Japan, um, obviously the rest of the world is true, but even in Japan, I think initially, uh, even the people who, for example, had stock options didn't really know what that was or didn't really attribute value. But after the value was realized today, 
in, in a lot of companies we've invested in, that's a key motivator. And what we're seeing is senior people are leaving you know, safe jobs to move and, and try to make a go. So, so that's definitely true. I, I strongly believe that in addition to all the you know, fixing of all the Japan issues, I think the only way is now to look outside and to see the world as your playing ground. And frankly, there's a golden opportunity today where the global economies are still coming out. Japan has ample liquidity. Corporations are sitting on record amounts of cash. And so while some, some companies have started to do that, I believe that you know, that's a golden opportunity to just be aggressive, start, start doing acquisitions of technology, of businesses. But the, the history is not good of uh, Japanese companies making successful acquisitions. And the reason is you really don't want to go and create a mini Japan in America or Europe. I think, I think you have to sort of, again, it goes back to incentive systems, trying to be local, hire local managers, provide the incentives. You know, interesting story. We, we, we had a joint venture in China where uh, initially it was run as a Japanese control uh, company and it made losses. Then we changed the system and we said, the local managers come on and we share profits. And suddenly the company started to make a lot of money. So, so I, 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 think, I think that's something that I really believe is important, but that needs more risk capital to come in and uh, not just from venture capital funds, but, but I think Japanese commercial banks, Japanese government trying to encourage companies, or in fact, not just encourage, like there should be a, a, a forced sort of uh, uh, pressure to, to try to take advantage. And some people are doing it, you know, like Son San and, and Suntory and, and others are trying to do it. And, and I think 20 years from now, that, that potentially could be the big difference. Shikori-san, I think you, want, you talked a little bit about how data and uh, big data and analytics could be something that you think, in addition to people, in addition to capital, could really help. Do you want to uh, uh, take a few minutes? Yes. Um, I want to just uh, you know, so talk about uh, you know, so marketing, how it evolved. Um, because uh, again, Japan is pretty much behind of uh, um, hiring this new technology, you know, arguing data and digital, but still um, very behind uh, US and Europe. So, so just an overview, how market has changed. You know, in the near future, all the people in this world and the device will have at least one IP address cookie, email address, and social networking account. I'm not exaggerating. You guys all have at least, you know, these account, right? And then, you know, so we can change the way of marketing. Will we able to deliver a specific message to a specific person? That's the beauty of digital marketing. Even when we do not know the name of the person. So in a digital marketing era, we need to know, understand each customer, uh, interest in uh, making a relationship scenario with each customer. Not trying to deliver one message to multiple customer at once. You know, that's the beauty of the mass marketing. You know, concept is reach. But it doesn't work because now, everyone wanna have a different things. Everyone has a different interest. So, the market has been changed totally you know, compared to, you know, so before the internet. You know, the time of mass production, mass consumption, everyone wanna have the same things. If the neighbor bought TV, I wanna have a TV. So that's why mass marketing works. But uh, after internet was commercialized, information flow become five times, 500 times, larger than before the internet. That's only 10 years. It's increasing more. So now, you know, different person has a different interest, want to have a, you know, different product and service. That's why we need to send uh, some specific message to each person. 
Also, we have uh, some information from users. That's called we big, big data. So we have to make a well, digital marketing platform. So we have a uh, you know, relationship with brand, corporation, and users. It's the same as human relationship. The relationship with your wife and the girlfriend and boyfriend and husband. If the people do not know each other, but got to know it, and uh, interested in favor, you know, they like each other very like, and they love each other. So the, the brand has to make that kind of scenario with the users. That's the beauty of the digital marketing. There are a bunch of touch point. Compared to uh, before internet, we have a website, we have application, uh, you know, everything become a digital. So with these different touch point, we can get the all different data so that we would understand deeply what the people is, what the you, you are, what are your interest is. So the impact of big data is just a three, but it has a big impact. We could know prospective users. We could know information before purchase. We could know um, customers' feeling, you know, like or not, because they talked about in the uh, social media. If we analyze the website, we understand what you are looking for. So, in real time. So, this so is the system. Is, this is, is that, the system. <laughs> is, that, is that something that you think Japan can really learn? Uh, yeah, uh, Japan is behind. So Japan does not really care, I would say, uh, you know, customers' experience. Japan care product, service per se. But Japan doesn't care the user experience. You know, so the big corporation, CEO of the big corporation, US corporation, always talk about customers' experience, but no one, no CEO, no president in the big corporation in Japan I have never heard the term user experience. So that system can make, because with data, we understand what user wants. Thank you. Let me maybe, uh, it's, uh, given the time, uh, turn it to, the, uh, to you, the audience, and uh, maybe uh, ask for questions or comments. If you can, when you ask a question, take the, uh, uh, the microphone and uh, state um, briefly who you are and who would you, you would like to have the questions. I think there's a gentleman at the, the beginning, at the um, front. Hello. I'm Saito Mbish. I have a question about the strength of Japan. Um, currently, I'm working in a foreign company, and uh, I'm under competition against internal entity, that means a China entity and the European entity. And sometimes I feel that competition is much stronger than real competitor <laughs> external. So to protect our labor and uh, to keep it, keep a business driver, we had to fight against our internal competition. In, in this case, I had to find our st use strengths with Japan. So I think we share the issue of Japan. So could you tell me about your strengths, your perspective about strengths of Japan? Um, do you, Ankur, you want to start because you looked at a lot of. Yeah, I, I think you know the, the 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 just looking at it from a from a global perspective, the the strength is that it's a big economy and it's a very special economy. So, it's hard for outsiders to come in and do business. I, I mean, it's a it's in some ways it's a negative thing, but in your situation, it's actually a plus because if people care about the Japanese market, you have to have a local team and you have to rely on that. But, but in ideal world, y you know, what, what you probably want is that it's because the value add and the productivity of the, of the people here and the skill set and know-how is actually the best and therefore, you know, the global consumers are benefiting from whatever is being produced here. But I get, I get you know, we, in our business also we have to compete with the, with the uh, global teams. Um, but the market is a big advantage, uh, I think. Murakami-san, you have... One thing I will highlight uh, is um, 
uh, at OECD, we do a lot of different surveys. Uh, but one of the surveys that we do is uh, on people's skills, education and, and skills. We call it adult uh, skill survey. Japan is number one um, in terms of the um, uh, numeric um, testing, in terms of you know numbers, uh, mathematics. Uh, Japan is number one in the category of literacy as well, so reading and writing. Um, so overall, Japan came out top. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Um, men and women, by the way, uh, both men and women, I mean, aggregate as well. Uh, so I would say in terms of the strength, I mean, there are a number of different uh, areas, but I would say one of the most um, important uh, competitive advantages that Japan has is, is, uh, is, uh, is people. It's incredible, um, you know. If, if I look at these test scores, it's it's incredible. The gap, um, if you look at the distribution of scores, uh, the, uh, the the Japanese population um, has a very um, thick concentration in the middle. So everyone is well educated. Everyone can read. Everyone can write. Even everyone can do math. No problem. In the United States, for example. Um, uh, the distribution is very wide. So there are a bunch of people who are like genius, you know, and then there are people who are not, you know, who, who can't even write and read. Um, so I would say Japan has a lot of potential because the human resources uh, in terms of the, um, the skill level, extremely high, I mean, higher than any other countries. I, at the same time, I must say, we're not really maximizing the talent pool we have. I think we need to change the system so that um, this talent pool is, is maximized. I think there is a lot that we're leaving on the table right now. And the good news is we're not talking about rebuild, uh, we're not talking about building the educational system. We already have it. So it's a matter of changing the system so that the talent pool that we have is utilized. So it's not going to take two generations. Um, it's, it's not going to take, you know, for some countries it's, it's, a, it's a commitment of, of 20 or 30 years uh, to build infrastructure in terms of education. We are not talking about that. We're talking about the, uh, the current talent pool, which is already very high in terms of skill levels, trying to utilize that more efficiently. And if I can add my own uh, view, because I, I always use that, but the thing that struck me is everybody when you arrive in Japan, sort of uh, people, when you talk to everybody in the world, they sort of say, what are Japan's strengths? You know, there is all this, you know, debt and aging, and, you know, it's very easy to paint a very poor picture. Uh, but then, you know, I've worked, I had the opportunity to work quite a bit in Germany in my career. And uh, Japan, to me, very, seems, very, looks very much like Germany was 15 years ago. Uh, very strong companies, very little debt in the companies, very high technology, just as a sense. Um, Japan uh, companies own between uh, 35 and 55 percent of patents for the last 20 years. So um, a very good workforce, it's very dedicated. And so, you know, it's, you know when I look, and it's very hard to our French to admit it, but when I look at Germany today, I think we're all happy in Europe to have Germany. And so I'm looking at it and saying, if Japan would just do the same, by the way, if you do the mass, it would create a GDP of Greece. Uh, if we would do the same growth as Germany, it would create a GDP of Greece, Greece every three years. Uh, so, you know, which I think as a European, we, it sort of measures up. Uh, so I think there is a more strengths and assets that I think people will leverage. Um, maybe in the back. You are close to the mic. That, uh, there was a few, I'm confusing, I mean, pretty confused here from the panelist uh, point of views, you know. You know, uh, Yumiko was telling, you know, that the Japanese are so good, uh, the, the most brilliant people around, you know. And then Ankur is saying, you know, Japanese were arrogant, you know, they were throwing away Chinese. <laughs> 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 and they were... <laughs> They were throwing away Chinese technology and uh, not be careful, and then they gave it to Chinese management, and the profits were like grown up like anything, you know. And then Fujio san is saying, you know, uh, Shiro san is saying, you no, know, like uh, we have uh, white collar problems, you know, she didn't show much, you know. And I'm not sure your view, you need to probably sum up, you know. What are we really, what is the issue with Japan right now? We have, you. <laughs> We have edge over everything, you said. We have regenerative medicine. Proto is probably one of the leaders in that. We have the best equipment. We have the good people. We have everything. We have the money, the third largest economy. 
What do you think? What's wrong? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Ishiguro-san. <laughs> no, I think, uh, you know, so the, you know, our argument is we have a lot of good things to asset, but the problem is it's totally distributed in the different, uh, you know, place. Okay, uh, our productivity is low, but, uh, you know, there is a, you know, so this is, a, this is good things because we just, you know, so increase the productivity, we can grow. So there is a gap in between, you know, so things and things. But we were, we had the one of the best productivity. You know, we had always technology. No, 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 white collar productivity white collar, is bottom. Okay. So, so, so. White collar productivity was always low. So for yeah. example, for example, okay, we have a money. You know, where we have a money? In big corporation. That's right. So where we have a technology, startup. But there is a, you know, so something is missing to, you know, so, so make this, you know, so match. So that's we have to solve it. But that's uh, you know, so the way of good, good because we already have an asset. So we try to find you know, something, fill the gap. Maybe the, maybe, maybe the problem is you're hearing us wrong, but uh, <laughs> first of all, I, <laughs> me, none no, no, of you guys. The, 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 uh, first of all, I never said anybody's arrogant, but. <laughs> But, but I, I do think, you know, all the things you listed are true. The only thing I would say is, yes, but are we really using that to capture the global market? That's, that, right. that's really the essence of, you know, why those things that we talked about. Because it's always in the context of second largest economy in the world. How can we improve things there? But, you know, I take Germany's example. I think the reason German, Germany in the last sort of 10 years, it's all export driven. And, and not export to Europe, but outside Europe. So to me, and again, that's why hopefully you listen this time, but it's all about, it's all about the global growth. And, and the, the fact is Japan's productivity is low. I mean, that's, that's proven by many data points. OECD, we actually publish productivity um, measurements every year. Japan has been low, um, you know, always at around 20th, you know, 19th, 20th, 21st, depending on the exchange rate, it's been always low. It's been always the lowest of the G7 countries. So that's the fact. And there's, I think, uh, very little argument against it. So um, um, given the fact that the productivity is low, we need to figure out how we can actually change that. Uh, I think what we're trying to say here is uh, we do have a lot of really good elements. So productivity, or maybe just we call it innovation, is, is all about producing more, you know, producing more outputs by better combining different inputs. And in terms of inputs, we have really good stuff here. We talked about human resources, you know, very well educated uh, people. Uh, we have a lot of capital. Liquidity is great in Japan. There are a lot of technologies. So it's, it's a matter of tweaking the system. We have all the raw materials here. So it's a matter of tweaking the system so that combination of these different inputs can produce better uh, output. And I think that uh, we are very lucky that we have all the raw materials. Uh, it's not going to take 20 years for us to educate next generation. We have very good labor force. Um, I think that's that's the that's uh, that's what we're talking about here. Um, okay. Uh, why don't you, don't you look at the you know some slide I have uh, in terms of the productivity of white color? It's not the really difficult things. You know, so it's not the really high innovation. You know, how to improve the productivity is like, uh, you know, like this. You know, so we are kind of, you know, so overwhelmed with uh, very routine work, you know, administrative work. But we can, so IT can take over. And, uh, and we have a limited space. You know, Japanese company always, you know, so recommended to come to the office. But we can work at home. We can work at transit time. And the seniority system uh, become a results-oriented system. Let's talk about you know some efficiency is uh, something like this. If you make the you know expense report in a company once a month, take 30 or one hour because we look at our schedule and we look at the you know transition cost side or Yahoo or Google and make na you know 160 or something like that. But so it takes 30 minutes or one hour. But if you combine that, you know, making a database with a scheduler of a database of transportation cost and the address uh, to the company we visit, just uh, one click. 
you know, we can start from that small things, you know, increase the productivity. Can I, I think there's many other people. There's at least three gentlemen in the front, so, <laughs> on this side. Hi, um, this is Ken Watanabe. I'm working currently at uh, American company. Okay, um, um, this session uh, right now, uh, productivity is a big thing uh, to talk about. But I think my perspective, uh, productivity is something what, um, um, how does it, enabler to a growth and uh, anchor to a growth. And I think uh, um, Debu, Mr. Debu, you just saw earlier today this session, um, entrepreneurship is another subject or agenda for Japan growth. And I think uh, it's need to be a big driver, driving force to a uh, next growth of Japan. Uh, Ishiguro-san, you are the real entrepreneur, I think, so that I'd like to uh, hear a panelist, um, what is your thoughts around that? I mean, entrepreneurship. Great. Uh, you know, just uh, on, on this thing, um, the question of entrepreneurship, and it's related to the previous question. Um, I think part of the question in Japan is exactly this notion of aspiration and being a global aspiration and risk taking. If you think about data, yes, people are very well educated, but they don't take as much risk. And the system is very uh, resistant to an allow for risk, uh, whether it's the bank uh, financing. That's why you know, having um, uh, uh, people, uh, organization like Globis and others who actually uh, provide funding to take risk is so important. Because otherwise, there is very limit, a big limitation. To, to me, the, um, the issue is not so much do you have people with the right quality. The question is, do you create an infrastructure that enables uh, to pay risks and to finance at the right level? And that's on the what the banks, the VC firms, et cetera, needs to do. Uh, and at the same time, you need to have people in Japan who are looking at whatever they want to innovate in, um, in terms of a market, of a global marketplace not a pure Japan marketplace. You know, one thing I, I don't know what's, but what thing strikes me is when I meet entrepreneurs in Japan, successful entrepreneurs, most of them have spent time in the, in, in outside of, of Japan. You know, and that's, that's quite striking. That's so, somewhere that means that notion of being global has, is not, is, uh, it comes if you have been outside. Um, it has to become, I think, even if you are residing in Japan. Ishiguro-san, if you want to comment from your experience as an entrepreneur. <laughs> I'm not really a great entrepreneur, but uh, um, again, you know, so the access to a capital does really matter in terms of, uh, you know, so the, you know, making up, uh, you know, big global scale of, uh, you know, company, startup. Um, you know, after the collapse on that bubble, sort of startup has uh, really you know, pushed down. So uh, mass media really, you know, so the uh, target to, uh, you know, startup. So that notion has to be changed, first of all. You know, so in the, in the Bay Area of San Francisco, in Silicon Valley, I spent, uh, you know, 10 years. Uh, people just like in a startup. I just have a very small startup. You know, I told in the drug store, I have a company. Uh, people, you know, ask me what I'm doing. You know, I don't know why, but uh, I have a company, small company. And the people were so pleased me. Okay, you know, look at this lady. You know, this lady has a, you know, own company. And I felt so good about it. So, but in Japan, you know, so no one, you know, <laughs> no, one, no one told me I'm, 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 I'm being good. But uh, you know, this you know, kind of culture, uh, philosophy has to be changed. So uh, that's one. And uh, access to capital still does really matter. Um, I sometimes argue that you know, so if Google cannot be successful in Japan, if, even if we have a kind of same technology Google invented, search engine, you know, the Google cannot happen in Japan because Google had a funded, was funded about uh, one billion US dollar before um, in, uh, IPO. 
So there are no capital to invest to a startup. But uh, um, it's, not a, it's not easy to you know, set up the same system uh, in the Silicon Valley in Japan as a Silicon Valley. But uh, again, I argue that uh, you know, big corporation has a big money. If we can approach to a you know, big corporation, uh, big corporation can help us to you know, spend a big money with our technology, it may be a, you know, so the solution in Japan. Uncle, you want to be, I mean, you represent big money to some extent, so. <laughs> <laughs> No, but, but it's interesting because, um, you know, to share a perspective, when, 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 when I sit on our global investment committee and when we go uh, ask for, you know, uh, money for investing in, in different countries, in the end, and again, I'm, I'm a broken record, but the problem is not about entrepreneurship, people, technology, know-how, et cetera. I think it's, it's about the market potential. I think for investors, it's all about how big is the market. You know, for example, uh, you know, Facebook, theoretically, you could have six billion consumers on Facebook. That's attractive. And, and, and they marketed it appropriately such that they said, hey, first of all, we don't make money, but then this information is important, so on and so forth. As long as the innovation and the productive growth and, and the skills are all geared towards a market that's perceived to be declining, it's an uphill battle to go and say, this company, great product, has 20% market share of Japanese market. So what? It's a declining market, aging population. Who cares? And, and, and that's why I think from an investor's perspective, the biggest appeal is it's great technology, great people, and by the way, it's going to change the world or it's going to take over the world or the products around the world. And that's how it used to be. The Sony Walkman is a great example. The, you know, Panasonic TV is a great example. But those types of things, I think, not happening because people got happy with the local economy, and, and it's a big economy. And the next, the reliance on China. So now that China is doing this, I think it's another wake-up call. So finally, at least from our perspective, we're seeing Japanese companies wanting to go abroad. We started a food company in India in partnership with Mitsui. Uh, and, and that's a one way to partner with global investors to go outside because sometimes the risk going alone is, is high. Can I uh, just ask for one more here and then we'll go on the other side. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nakano, I'm uh, I think my capital. Uh, just one question, uh, uh, how to say the, uh, what think about the Japanese, you know, uh, Japanese uh, level of the education? Uh, you said, you know, uh, product uh, very good, but I don't think so, cause uh, you know, <laughs> cause uh, the, if uh, all you know, all, all uh, the uh, surveys done by the English uh, should be very low, because you know, uh, the Japanese, Japanese, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, languages, uh, uh, they had to say, abilities very, very low. And uh, even you know, uh, think about you know, um, uh, uh, this kind of you know, uh, information, uh, internet information, all in English. But almost all Japanese you know, reading in Japanese. So it means uh, very isolated. Uh, the uh, ordinary Japanese people not really you know, know about the you know, global uh, movement. So uh, I think you know, oh, this is a big problem. You said, you know, you people said, you know, Japanese are very good. I don't think so. Where are going, San? Okay, so the, uh, just to give you a little bit more details in terms of how we measure um, skills, um, the, um, uh, there are different categories. Um, there are three major categories. One is numeric, like I said, it's math. It's simple math, uh, pretty straightforward. Japan number one. Um, uh, but uh, this is the, this is the uh, adult uh, skill survey, so it's between the age of 16 and 65. Uh, the second one is literacy, so you know whether people can write or read. And, and we do, by the way, these tests are done in Japanese. The third category, I think this is really important: problem solving, yes. problem solving skills. Japan is low. So I agree with you that there are major, major challenges that the Japanese uh, population, Japanese people face. They can write, they can read, they can do math. Can they really apply their writing skills and, and reading skills and mathematical skills? Um, 
in a critical way, in a critical thinking is actually one of the weakest areas, so that they can solve, they can identify issues, and they can solve issues on their own. The answer is probably not so well, okay? So I, I agree with you in the sense that, you know, you said, you know, there are probably um, people in Japan who are not really, you know, up to date in terms of global trends and so on and so forth. I think what you're trying to say is this, and I think this is really critical because at the end of the day, you can just look up, you know, if you don't know a word or if you don't know something, you can look it up on the internet. You can look up on Google, you can just Google. So what you know may not have the same value as it used to, say, 20 years ago. What's more important going forward is critical thinking, problem solving skills. And like I said, the three categories we measure, the Japanese people, on an aggregate basis, basis, Japan is still the best in terms of the, the, the scores, because they get really high scores in math and high scores in reading. And, but the, uh, average, uh, the uh, uh, problem solving skills, low. And I think I, I would argue that category, the third category, is going to be even more important going forward as the internet becomes such a big part of our day-to-day -day life. So I don't know if I answer your question, but you know, just because Japanese people are well educated, they are, you know, they're fine. That's that's not what I'm trying to say. Uh, I completely agree with uh, you know, so Yumiko, because uh, you know, so Japanese education just to focus on memory. You know, entrance examination just tests the memory, so that's too bad. I had my son, I have a son who was educated in the United States. I was educated both, but uh, I, I observed the total difference. Uh, Japanese education, uh, you know, the U.S. education is, I know, I know it, which is good, but uh, um, at least in Japan, just memorize the things. In U.S., uh, just have uh, some, you know, so issue and, uh, you know, the business has no, no right answer. We have to come up with how to, you know, grow in a different way. Well, that, you know, these things, Japanese education do not really educate to a uh, poor student. I think this is a tough act to follow, so I will uh, propose that maybe we, we will close off with asking each of you to sort of say, you know, what was the one thing you would want uh, people in this room and people in, in Japan to do? And I'll start with you, Anko. You know, I, th I think all of us should be aggressive in terms of investing in, in entrepreneurs and also if you're in a big company, buying businesses overseas. I think that's critical for, uh, for Japan's uh, growth. Since the, the topic of this panel was uh, productivity, um, working harder is not the same as working smarter. And I think we need to focus on how to work smart. And we are working already hard enough. I think we're putting, again, just mentioning OECD survey, Japanese people put in longest working hours compared to any other countries. So let's be smart. And let's not, we're not talking about working harder, but working smarter. Fujio. I think it's the same kind of things. We are already you know, so very hard worker. But, uh, you know, so the set up some system, you know, allowing us to, you know, work smarter or taking a risk. That's a set, you know, sort of system that Japanese do not really good at. But uh, to be logical, to be more uh, perspective and, uh, you know, make the system, you know, allowing us, helping the people to work smarter. And I just would uh, add to, to that is I think part of it is being open to the global world, much more open, much more looking for. It's not that people are, Japanese people are not uh, nice to interact with it. They have to be proactively looking uh, outside. And it doesn't mean that you need to lose your Japanese roots. If I look at uh, German companies, they tend to be very German. Uh, French companies, even more French. <laughs> so <laughs> Spaniards, right? So you don't have to not be Japanese, but you have to be, uh, um, uh, have global empathy and being able to absorb the rest of the world. So on this, thank you very much for participating. Thank you for, uh, to your panelists. Thank you very much.